Hi there. Um, good evening, everybody. So tonight I am going to record our lecture on the bones. I don't know that I'll get all the way through it tonight, but what I don't get through, I will record and post for Friday. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to do a live class on Friday either um, because of the same situation with the kids. So knock on wood, the kids are feeling okay. Kids are feeling great. So thank you, everybody, who said you know, good luck with everything. Um, but it seems like, uh, it seems like they're going to pull through this just fine. It's just a matter of the schools, um, you know, being very careful. And a kid, uh, a student tested positive, so they have to be extra careful and, you know, make sure that everybody's doing well and has negative tests and all that kind of thing before coming back. So, that said, tonight I will start to cover the skeletal system. Now, a big part of this, the, the entire first part of this chapter, uh, more than half the slides of this chapter, are going through the arrangement of bone itself, the arrangement of the tissue, um, which we'll go over first. We will go over the names of some of the bones and things like that, but that's at the end of the chapter. And you have a lab assignment that's going to reinforce that, which I'll go over on Friday with you guys, um, whether it's pre-recorded or not. So let's get right into the skeletal system. So most of us think of the skeleton as being just bones and the bones are a huge part of it, but the skeletal system itself is comprised, comprised of more tissue than just bone. It includes cartilage, Right, and ligaments and other connective tissues that stabilize the bones or connect the bones together. And so you have to start out thinking about functions of the skeletal system. Well, support, everybody always you know, can think of that. Support for the entire body, it's just structural support for us. It's also a huge site of storage of minerals. Um, things like calcium are stored in high levels in our bones. Uh, phosphorus is another one. At the center of the bones, we'll see that there's yellow bone marrow, which is a, a storage of lipids, lipids which are for um, energy reserves. It's also where all of our blood cells are produced. So not just red blood cells, but red blood cells and white blood cells are produced in the bone marrow, so uh, the center of all of our long bones. And then protection, most people think of that. So a lot of people miss two and three. Right, protection, most people can think of. We think of the skull, how it protects the brain, the ribs protect the heart and the lungs, and leverage. They are a place where um, muscles can connect to the bones and move those bones, right? That's what the leverage is, or that's where the levers are. All muscles do is get shorter, right? But when they get shorter, if they pull a bone along with them, that creates some sort of movement. So most of the skeletal system, like I said, is made of bone or osseous tissue. And it is a connective tissue, which means the cells are pretty far apart. They have a lot of material between the cells. So that's called the matrix. The cells in the bone are called osteocytes. Anytime you see this prefix osteo, that tells you bone. And everything that's between them, outside of them, is part of the matrix. And the matrix, most of the weight or two thirds of the weight of the bone is made up of calcium salts. There's this calcium phosphate um, molecule that makes up most of the weight of the bones. That's what we think of as that dense, rigid calcium phosphate. There are also these protein fibers that are outside the cells. Um, so collagen fibers primarily, collagen fibers just give the bones some strength and stability as well. Bones themselves in the skeleton may are classified by their shape oftentimes. So we have long bones, short bones, flat bones, and irregular bones. Um, long bones are just longer than they are wide. So yes, the bone of your upper arm or the bone of your, you know, your upper leg, those are long bones. But the bones of your fingers are long bones as well, even though they're not very large, right? They're longer than they are wide. 
short bones are about as wide as they are long. So they're kind of round almost. Um, think of like the bones of your wrist, the bones that make up your ankles, those are short bones. Flat bones are thin and relatively broad. In flat bones, you usually think of bones of the skull. Um, sometimes the, the scapula, which is the um, shoulder blade, is thought of as a flat bone. And then there are irregular bones that are kind of a funny shape. They don't line up to anything. They don't seem like anything. A vertebrae is the classical example of an irregular bone. It's not long, it's not short, it's not flat. So in the next part of this, we're going over the features of a long bone. So these would be the bones that make up your limbs primarily, your arms, your legs, your fingers, your toes. The long bone itself, and I'm going to go to this diagram for it. The long bone itself is given a name for the shaft and a name for each end. The shaft of a long bone is always called the diaphysis, and each end is called an epiphysis. Okay, so the rounded end is the epiphysis, is the diaphysis. So this is your upper arm bone, your humerus. Each long bone in every bone in your body, pretty much, is made up of a combination of compact bone and spongy bone. Okay, compact bone makes up the outer thickness of the bone. So, um, you know, if you think of an M&M, right, the compact bone is the candy coating. It's the outer shell. And inside of that is your spongy bone. Okay, so all the way around the edges of this entire bone is a thickness of compact bone. Okay, the compact bone is what we think of as bone. It's very dense, it's very rigid, it can support a lot of weight. Underneath that is spongy bone. It is much less rigid. We will see that microscopically, it's arranged in a much more irregular arrangement. Okay, it does, it's, not, it's not these regular circles that we'll see. Um, so we always have this outside thickness of compact bone, that is spongy bone. At the center of every long bone, so in the middle of the diaphysis, if you were to make a cut right through the diaphysis, you would find a cavity. And that cavity is called the marrow cavity. In the marrow cavity, you have red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow is where all your blood cells are made. Red blood cells, white blood cells, they're all made in the bone marrow of all your lung bones. So even as an adult, all of your blood cells, which you're continually making millions of blood cells every day, are being made at the center of your lung bones. The yellow marrow that's in there is just lipids, it's fat and it's there for energy reserve, right? Um, so there's yellow bone marrow and red bone marrow in this bone marrow cavity. The bone itself is covered by a layer called the periosteum. Now we'll see the prefix peri pretty often in anatomy and physiology. Peri means around, right? So I think of perimeter as the area around something. Periosteum. This surrounds every single bone. And at the ends of a, each long bone is a cartilage pad. It's called articular cartilage. It's called articular because it's where this bone articulates with another bone. Wherever one bone meets another bone, that's called an articulation. And you have kind of this little cartilage pad at every articulation. Um, because there is movement at those articulations. And so it allows for those bones to move against each other without, you know, friction building up, without those bones grinding on each other. The outer surface is the periosteum, right? Remember, peri is surrounding. The inner surface is lined by what's called the end osteum. So endo, the prefix endo means inner. So basically the, the bone marrow cavity is lined by the endosteum. 
And like I said, in a long bone, you have compact bone, which is dense, which is what we think of as bone, and spongy bone underneath it. Compact bone is in a very definite arrangement. And so here is what you would see with compact bone under a microscope. Okay, this picture over here is exactly something that you would see in compact bone. Now, don't mistake this hole at the center for the for the uh, marrow cavity. It's not like that. There's an arrangement of circles here. There's another arrangement of circles to the left. There's another arrangement of circles to the upper right, to the lower right. There are all these circular arrangements. Each set of circles, which has kind of this bigger circle at the middle, and then a set of circles around it, is called an osteon, right? So an osteon is this whole set of circles. Each individual circle is called a lamella, right? So you can see you have one lamella here, you have another one that's further in, you have another one that's further in. The one in the center that's large is called the central canal. Now, bone is a connective tissue, meaning that the cells are far apart, right? There's a lot of matrix between them. The bone cells themselves are sitting in these dark spots. So these dark ovals are actually like little caves. And those caves are called lacunae. They're little hollowed out areas in the thick bone. And the bone cells themselves sit in the lacunae. The bone cells are called osteocytes. Okay, so we've got osteocytes sitting in lacunae. The lacunae are sitting in these concentric circles, which are called lamellae. The center circle is called the central canal. In that central canal is where the blood vessels are. Now you need to get blood from the central canal to each of these cells, right? The blood is bringing oxygen and glucose to the cells. So you have all these tiny little canals. You can see them as light lines on here coming out from the center, going to each of these osteocytes that are sitting in lacunae. Okay. Those are called canaliculi, they're small channels. They connect the lacunae to the blood vessels so that the lacunae can get nutrients and can get rid of waste products, right? Because the cells are sitting in the lacunae. So here's, here's a redrawing of that. Right. What we were looking at on that one microscope slide was one osteon. You can see you've got more osteons. You've got one, two, three, four of them here, and then a couple of half ones that you can see that are cut off. Um, so this whole thing that looks like a wedding cake, that one whole thing is an osteon. Right? What you would see over here on the, the right, the far right, would be the periosteum, the covering of the bone. Then you have some thickness that is compact bone, that's where these osteons are. Then to the inside of that is spongy bone, right? Then here to the left of this picture would be the center of the bone. And if you keep going to the left, there would be more spongy bone. And then keep going to the left, there'd be more compact bone. And all the way at the left edge would be the other, the periosteum on the other side. So I'm just trying to orient you. So the, the marrow cavity is to the left, of the spongy bone in this picture. Spongy bone you can see is not arranged in circles. There are not you know, all these terms with the uh, concentric circles and the central canal and the lamellae and the osteocytes and everything else. The, the uh, spongy bone is just arranged in these, what are called trabeculae, right? These kind of finger-like projections. So then we get to a situation where we talk about different types of bone cells. There are osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. All three of them are types of bone cells. You can tell because of the prefix "oste." In general, if the cell name ends with blast, it's a young cell. 
it's a new cell. If it ends in site, it is actually a mature cell. Right? What we have are osteocytes are the mature cells. They maintain bone structure, right? They're, they're the ones that recycle calcium salts. They maintain bone, they're what we think of as bone cells. But we have these osteoblasts and these osteoclasts. They do opposite things. Osteoblasts produce new bone. What they do is they can actually take calcium from your blood and deposit that calcium into the matrix surrounding the bone cells to make the bones more dense or to make the bones grow in the case of growing from you know, uh, an infant up to an, ad an adult. Okay, so the osteoblasts are producing new bone. Right? They actually take calcium and they make the bones thicker and stronger. Osteoclasts do the opposite. They secrete an enzyme that dissolves the matrix. They're dissolving the calcium right, to release the calcium into your bloodstream. When we are young, I'll go back to this. When we are young, when you are uh, an infant all the way through youth into, an, into early adulthood, osteoblasts are really active. Osteoclasts are not very active. So it's important to get a lot of calcium early in your life because your osteoblasts are going to take that calcium and make your bones stronger, denser. As we age, osteoclasts become more active. Osteoblasts become less active. So in people that are older, like elderly age, right, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, osteoclasts are so active that they are pulling calcium from your bones faster than it's being put down, right? And the bones start to become brittle because they're losing a lot of calcium. That's a, a situation where you, somebody has osteoporosis. So we've got the, the structure of bone, we've got the types of bone cells. We get to something called bone formation. How does a bone actually form? There's really two ways that a bone actually forms. One is called intramembrous ossification, and one is called endochondral ossification. Right. Ossification is just a, a fancy word for bone formation. Intramembranous ossification is where the bone forms from the membranes. It just directly becomes bone. Endochondral ossification. If we break down that word. Endo means within, and chondral always means cartilage. C H N C H O N D, right? It has to do with cartilage. So endochondral ossification happens from cartilage, from a cartilage template. And all the long bones in our body form through this second process called endochondral ossification. So the bones of like your arms and your legs, for instance start off as being just cartilage, and then that cartilage calcifies, it becomes bone. And that's a process called endochondral ossification. Right? So intramembranous ossification, this, this first thing, is direct bone formation. There is no cartilage template, right? It occurs during fetal development. So while you're still in the womb, these bones develop within sheets of fibrous tissue. And this usually makes flat bones, like the bones of the skull. But long bones are formed by endochondral ossification. Many of the bones of our skeleton are formed this way. And what that means is they start off as cartilage. Even when an infant's born, there is a large amount of cartilage still in all their skeletal elements. Um, so here you can see, if we just kind of take this, this as a, maybe the upper arm, let's say. So in blue here, this is cartilage. Every, every time you see blue, that's gonna be cartilage. Okay, you can see that the kind of the middle of this long bone is called the diaphysis. Each end is called the epiphysis, right? What happens is at the center of the bone, at the center of the diaphysis, 
these cells, which were blue, they were cartilage, now start to turn to bone. Okay, they get a signal, they start to turn to bone. And that's called the primary ossification center. That's right at the center of the diaphysis. Okay, everything that's in blue is still cartilage. Right? But going out from this ossification center, those bones are, those cells are becoming bone. What happens a little while later is the same thing happens at the center of each epiphysis. Okay. So you can see here, each epiphysis is still cartilage. At the center of each epiphysis is what's called a secondary ossification center. And those cells start to turn from cartilage to bone. And they start to work their way towards the center, towards the diaphysis. Now, the entire time that you are growing, the entire time that you are still a teenager, right, and, and an adolescent or a teenager and you're growing taller, your long bones are growing longer, right? The leg bones are growing longer, the arm bones are growing longer. What's going to happen is this cartilage remains. There, there is a region of cartilage that remains between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, right? By the time all of the epiphysis becomes bone and it meets up with the diaphysis, you're done growing. I thought I had a better picture of that, but I don't. So what happens is this cartilage, right? This epiphyseal cartilage is sometimes called the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. So sometimes if you've um, gone to a doctor or you've brought your, your kids to the doctor and they've done bone scans or even x-rays, they can see the size of this growth plate. They can see how much of it is cartilage. And that's what the doctor is looking at and referring to when they say, oh, their growth plates are still wide open or their growth plates are almost closed. If the growth plate is still wide open, that means there's a lot of cartilage here. And it's going to be a while before that all turns to bone. And that's an indication that this long bone will get significantly longer. So your child or yourself or whoever's going and getting this test done um, will likely be taller than they are at that point. If the doctor says, well, their epiphyseal plate is closed, right? Their growth plate is closed. That means that basically the bone cells from the epiphysis have met up with the bone cells from the diaphysis. And there's only like a little tiny line of cartilage there, meaning you're done growing. The bones are not gonna get any longer. Right? And from that, they often estimate, doctors will often estimate how tall a person will get. So that epiphyseal line is just the line of cartilage between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. And it, it does turn, once it closes, it turns to just a line instead of being a plate, instead of being any thickness associated with it. It's just a line by the time we're an adult, right? By the time the bone cells from the epiphysis meet the bone cells from the diaphysis, it's just a line that's there. However, bones continue to grow throughout our life. They just don't grow any longer. So once you're done with puberty, you've hit your full height, that's it. Your long bones don't grow any longer. What they do grow is they grow in diameter. That's called appositional growth. They grow wide. And they do this usually to support more weight, right? But just based on needs of your body, they will continue to grow wide. What happens is those cells that make up the periosteum, the outer covering, develop into osteoblasts. And so they can lay down new calcium and make that bone wider, right? They can lay down more rings of bone. And then the osteoclast can erode the inner surface. So the marrow cavity enlarges as a result. So as we age, these bones get wider and wider and the center becomes wider as well. Okay, and here's, a, here's a, an example of that. You can see that the cells on the outside 
turn to osteoblasts and they become thicker, right? So the new bone that's deposited is drawn in pink here. And then on the inside, the bone is being reabsorbed by osteoclasts. So that's this white ring in here. So the, the ring on the inside keeps getting larger and the outside keeps getting larger as well. Overall, it's going to be about the same thickness, right? But the entire bone is bigger now. The entire bone is wider in diameter. The timing of that closure of the epiphysial plate, so this is going back to long bones growing taller, um, varies from bone to bone. On your fingers and toes, right, that, that epiphysial plate closes early. Um, the arm bones, the leg bones, and the pelvis bones close much later. Um, usually, you can see it clearly on something like the femur, one of the big leg bones. It differs from person to person, usually, um, or naturally, I should say. Uh, different timing in males versus females. It's mostly to, due to differences in sex hormones. Um, so at puberty, there's an influx of either estrogen or testosterone, and that makes this growth happen at a much quicker rate. And then after a certain amount of time of getting that hormone, those bone cells close or that epiphyseal plate closes. Now, usually um, females, usually females uh, will start growing earlier. Their bones will get longer earlier than males and their full growth, their adult growth will end up closing or their growth plates will end up closing before males do, right? So if you look like at boys and girls in middle school, a lot of the girls look very tall compared to the boys. Whereas if you look at that same class, maybe when they're 16 or 17, they're juniors in high school, uh, uh, many of the boys would be much taller than the girls. What's required for this bone growth? Well, calcium is the big one, right? Calcium salt. Um, during fetal development, this is absorbed from the mother bloodstream, right? But then after that, it's based on your intake, your dietary intake. So um, either what you get from food or if you take a calcium supplement or anything like that. Um, vitamin D3 also plays a role in metabolism, um, which is manufactured by skin cells, which are exposed to UV. Um, but you can also obtain this from supplements and from dairy products. Vitamin A and vitamin C provide support for osteoblasts to grow. And then there's also, you know, hormones that are involved. Growth hormone, growth hormone is secreted at really high levels in adolescents and in teenagers. And, and it's, in, it's secreted at much lower levels as we get to be adults. Um, the same thing with something like testosterone and estrogen, they're secreted at much higher levels in young people than they are in older people. Um, and then we'll learn about PTH and calcitonin when we talk about the endocrine system. Those play a, a pretty large role in this process as well. So then we get to skeleton as a calcium reserve. Because so much calcium is deposited in our skeleton, um, it's a place where we can get calcium from if we need to. So calcium plays a huge role in muscle contraction and in nerve cell conduction. It's really, really important. So we need a lot of calcium. So if you eat foods that are high in calcium and you take your supplements and you drink milk or whatever, then that calcium ends up in your blood. Whatever you eat or drink ends up in your bloodstream. If you have more than enough calcium in your bloodstream and a lot of calcium in your bloodstream, your body's going to store that calcium, right? Any excess calcium, it's going to store. It. And it's, it's going to, your body's going to secrete a hormone called calcitonin that will take that calcium that's in your bloodstream, that extra calcium and store it. And it stores it in your bones and it, takes, it has osteoblasts take it and make your bones thicker. If you don't get enough calcium in your diet 
and you don't eat enough calcium and take calcium supplements. You still need that calcium for muscles and nerves. And so what happens is your body starts secreting parathyroid hormone, PTH. Okay? Parathyroid hormone goes and it takes that calcium from your bones. It actually activates osteoclasts, which can break down the bone uh, matrix and start pulling calcium from your bones because you need a certain amount of calcium. And also, you also will secrete calcitriol, which will uh, allow you to, to uh, absorb more calcium from what you eat. So this, a lot of this is based on your diet. That's why you'd have calcium in your blood. And like I said, calcium is a, a mineral that's really important, that's necessary for a lot. We can't talk about bones without talking about fractures. Um, a fracture is a crack or a break in the bone. And there are two big categories of fractures. They're based on how they appear, right? You can have an open fracture or a closed fracture. Um, open and compound mean the same thing. An open fracture or a compound fracture is where the bone is sticking out through the skin. Really dangerous because of the risk of infection, right? Your skin is there to prevent pathogens from entering your body. If the skin isn't there anymore, then there's kind of this direct path for any of these microbes to get into your bloodstream. Closed fractures are considered simple fractures. They are completely internal, right? You have to take an x-ray to see that the bone is broken or fractured. So there's, there's no break in the skin or anything like that. And then they go on to name fractures by the nature or location of their break, right? There's all different types of fractures. As I said before, when we talked about bone cells, osteoclasts become more active as we get older. And so as a result, bones become thinner and weaker. It's a normal part of aging. Um, osteoclasts start to break down the bones more and more. Um, osteoblast activity slows. Osteoclast activity is constant. Um, a lot of this has to do with us um, losing a certain amount of estrogen or testosterone, these two hormones, as we, as we age. And so it results in something called osteopenia, um, which is just where bones become thinner and weaker. It can become osteoporos osteoporosis if it's more severe. Then we finally get to the bones, right? We get to bones and bone markings. And what I'm going to do is stop there. Um, so what I'll do is stop here. I'll stop the recording here. I will record another segment on the actual bones, the naming of the bones um, for Friday's class. I don't think I will be able to do Friday's class live. So I'll record another recording, another uh, recording over the rest of this PowerPoint to go over the names of some of the bones, why they're named the, the way they are and things like that. So I hope you get to view this and I hope that it's helpful. And I hope you all have a wonderful night and a wonderful day tomorrow. And I will talk to you soon.